24 years ago, I was hired as the manager for grounds and landscaping at Seattle University. And one of my first goals was to make this one of the most beautiful campus gardens in the United States. But I had another goal, and that was to try to garden without using as many pesticides as had been typically used in gardening in those days. So after I started working here, I had the good fortune of taking a course on how to use IPM in the landscape and tried to use it here. And now Seattle University is the only university in the state of Washington designated as a wildlife sanctuary by the State Department of Wildlife. And at the same time, this campus is listed in most of the books that describe the best gardens in the United States. So I was able to use IPM very successfully at Seattle University. Now the way I do IPM at Seattle University is that we use a mix of strategies. Instead of grabbing the pesticide can and spraying all the bugs, we use a mix of strategies to try and control a pest where the use of pesticides has to be the last resort and you have to choose one that's safest for people, pets, other animals, and the environment. Now the strategies we use, number one is cultural. It's probably the most important and that is you try and grow plants right. You know, about 80% of the problems I see with plants are because somebody planted that plant that likes sun in the shade, vice versa, it doesn't give it the right soil conditions, forgets to water it, makes a plant weak, and that makes it susceptible to insect and disease problems. Also, when you think of cultural control, try to avoid plants that have problems either insect or disease problems common in your area. So we try not to use roses that just get covered with disease, for instance. There are many roses that are disease resistant. We don't have to spray them. Same with apples, for instance. Some are resistant to apple scab. Now, when we talk about mechanical control, that's my favorite, by the way. That's the eek, squish, slice, dice, the bug. You know, so uh, my favorite method is El Kabatsky pest control. That's where you insert the insect between thumb and forefinger, and you have to yell El Kabatsky as you squish to get the full effect. Now, mechanical control can work really well, whether you use sticky traps or uh, you go out and cut slugs in half. Those are all great examples of mechanical control. Now, biological control can be done two ways. You can buy a bunch of insects and release them in your garden, and oftentimes they work quite effectively. But also, you can make life good for the beneficial insects that live in your garden, and oftentimes that's all it takes to get really good control. That brings up the last method, which should always be the last resort, and that is the use of pesticides. We occasionally use them at Seattle U. When we do, we're very careful to find the one that's safest for the environment, people, pets, and other animals. And remember that if you use a multi-spectrum pest control that kills the good guys along with the bad guys, then you're basically ruining your balance of nature. You're getting rid of the good guys that are doing a lot of your pest control for you. Now for IPM to work, there's one other thing you need to do, and that is you have to monitor. First of all, you gotta see if you have a pest you gotta deal with. The other thing is, when you do a treatment, you wanna monitor, you wanna go look to see if it works, so, and then keep records about that so you know what works and what doesn't. The key to doing effective IPM is to learn which plants have problems. And those are the ones that you're gonna go actually look under a leaf and check to see if you have a problem. We're gonna go around the campus and take a look at a few places where we use IPM and specifically how we use biological control to, to help fight insect problems, disease, and weeds as well. And weeds are the hardest by far, but we'll show you, we've had some pretty good successes. Now we started this program uh, because the birch trees got so full of aphids that the honeydew came pouring down and gave students free dippity dew treatments anytime they stood under the tree. In that area, we released lacewing insects that actually got in there and ate those aphids up. That started our program 24 years ago and we have used almost no pesticides ever since. Now here's a tree that plays a key role in the Seattle UIPM program, and it's called a Betula pendula darocarlica. What it is, it's the split-leaf weeping birch. 
And you might say, well, why is this tree so important in an IPM program? Well, this tree, you can see that uh, bark is kind of black. It gets covered with aphids every year. And you're probably going, well, what kind of nut wants that on their campus, covered with aphids, honeydew, pour it down? Well, if you put a tree like this in a place where people aren't going to sit and eat lunch under it, you know, they're not going to walk under it too often, then what this tree will do, it'll get covered with uh, harmful insects such as aphids, uh, scale, other uh, plant problem insects. And then what happens is in come all the beneficial insects. So your lace wings come in, your surfed flies, your minute pirate bugs, and of course, lady beetles but also many beneficial birds like the bush tits, the chickadees, they'll come in, they eat up all the bad guys, then they disperse all over the campus. And so right here, you could see evidence of where lady beetle little pupa cases, some people would call them cocoons, are here where lady beetles have been all over, good evidence that you've got beneficial insects at work on your campus. Now, for IPM to work, one thing you have to keep in mind is if you use a multi-spectrum spray that's going to kill these aphids, you're going to kill all these ladybugs and other beneficial insects, maybe even the birds that are coming to do the IPM for you. So if you've got such a big problem that honeydew is pouring down, maybe you'll come out and spray a powerful spray of water. Maybe you'll spray a little soap. You're going to try and target your pest. Don't use something that's going to kill the good guys. You're defeating your whole purpose. You're losing one of the big helpers to make your IPM system work. We're in the Seattle University Biology Building atrium. And uh, this is, there are thousands of house plants here that we have to maintain. And anyone who has to maintain house plants knows they're the biggest pain in the kazutsky of anything there is because you have to produce the sunshine, you have to be mom and nature giving them water. Most of the time it's really dry in buildings. It's really difficult to deal with insect pests. So here in this atrium, we had two major problems. We got scale on the ficus, this is ficus ali, and we got horrible scale attacks. In fact, they got so full of honeydew that people would stick to these benches when they're eating their lunch. <laughs> They didn't like that very much. The other problem we had were spider mites. It's so dry in here that uh, spider mites love those dry conditions. And so we would just start to see some of our ficus and palms start to die from that. So what are you going to do about that? What we did was we brought in beneficial insects. We brought in a little wasp called a metaphycus wasp and released it inside. Now these wasps are so little that you can barely see them with your naked eye. So nobody knew that they were flying around in here. And what they do is they parasitize, they lay an egg inside the nymph stage of scale. Now you're talking little here. <laughs> and what we did was we had the biology department uh, actually as one of their class projects monitor the scale to look to see if they had been invaded. You could see they turned a different color when they were invaded. And we actually tested to see if we were uh, killing the scale. And it really did work. Now, another thing we did, because of the dry conditions, one thing we tried to do was raise humidity. So we put water, little buckets full of water all over in this garden to try and uh, raise the humidity level and it helped a little bit but what we also did was we released beneficial mites in here and quite often we would see almost total control of the mite populations in here now uh, the mites always came back if we didn't keep the humidity high enough which was almost impossible in here so we were trapped in a situation where we had to use mites constantly one of the big solutions we found to solve the problem was we got rid of the plants that the mites liked the most. Those dumb palm trees, those indoor palms, camadoras, others. We got rid of those, replaced them with things like ficus and other plants that are more resistant to mites. That really helped with the problem. Now you may be wondering if people are going to freak out if you release uh, live insects to do biological control inside a building. Well. These insects generally are so small, and if you do it discreetly, no one even knows that you're releasing them. Also, people in most cases would prefer that you release insects instead of using powerful poisons they don't even know are on the plants when they're eating their lunch. 
The only problem I ever had was someone squealed that I released wasps in the president's dining room. I got in a little trouble when they caught me for that. But if no one would have told him, he'd have never known. So you don't really have to worry about the public minding that you do it. Landscape design is probably the most important element when it comes to weed control on a campus or even at a home. Now here's a little boo-boo that I made, oh la la, and that is that I, I saw on the design that we were going to put in all of these little pavers, they're about 12 by 12 pavers, looked beautiful, it gave it kind of a European look in this big walkway. Oh man, I couldn't believe what happened. Between every paver, weeds grew all the way around, every paver. There must be thousands of pavers in this long walkway here and we had to figure out a way to keep it under control. So the first thing I'd say is, I shouldn't have put these pavers in. They have stamped blacktop, stamped concrete. We could have done something instead of had little cracks in between. See, everywhere a weed grows, everywhere a seed drops, a weed is gonna grow between those pavers. Now, how do we deal with it? So what I did was I took a steam cleaner, ratched it down, and put out boiling water in a funnel between 208 and 212 degrees. I had a little gauge right there. If you put the water out about the same speed as a teapot and hold the water on there and it soaks in to hit the roots, it'll kill the roots of your weeds. And we found it didn't come back any faster than when we use Roundup. Unfortunately, it ate up my steam cleaner because they're not made that just poured out boiling water and made to put out steam, which doesn't work. So now what we do is use those new vinegar products You've got to make sure that you dilute them just right. If you overdo it or something, it's not going to work. And remember this, for vinegar to work, it has to be a hot, sunny day. You do this on a rainy day where it gets diluted. You do it on a shady day, the vinegar doesn't work. So this is a summer thing only. The only problem I've ever found with using that vinegar, it really does kill the roots of the weeds. The problem is everything in the world smells like vinegar for like a week. And if you go out that night, you're going to smell like vinegar too. So just keep that in mind. So remember we talked about the fact that weed seeds generally don't germinate unless they're hit by direct sunlight. So when you look at this, we have this beautiful planting of all different kinds of plants. And the only place I really need to weed it all is right here on the edges where that sun is penetrating into the earth. So you can have a beautiful garden with a lot of diverse plants and hardly have to weed it all. Using plants to control weeds doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. I'll show you an example of a really beautiful plant that even controls horsetail. Horsetail is one of the worst weeds in the garden and one of the hardest ones to get rid of. As a matter of fact, do you know what it means if you have horsetail in your garden? It means you were bad in your last life. So there are really good plants that will give you control of horsetail. This is a hardy geranium called Clarage Druse. Look at the beautiful flower on that. This grows in spring faster than horsetail. And then it gets about three feet tall. You don't see the horsetail at all. It'll bloom. Then we cut it down to six inches and we cut the horsetail at the same time, it grows back up and it'll bloom again. We do it three times a year. Now, this stuff seeds so aggressively that I planted three plants in a 300 by 15 foot bed right here. Within about two years, it covered the whole bed. Can this be a headache? Oh yeah, it can. It can come up on the other side of the street in a bed you don't want it in. The easy thing is, that in spring you can pull it out, no problem at all. It won't cause a real problem. Horsetail, of course, you can't get rid of. Now, I planted this about 20 years ago. Within three years, I never got a complaint about horsetail again. Here's the interesting thing. We didn't kill the horsetail. It's still alive in there. It's just no one ever sees it, so we don't have to weed it. But either way, it gets rid of your problem. Now here's an example of an easy and very effective IPM system that totally controlled the weeds on this bank. This bank used to be covered with blackberry, horsetail, all the worst weeds you could possibly get. We came in and cleaned it off. We have no water here, by the way, hot, sunny bank. Cleaned it off and we planted rock rose, Cystis corbariensis, 
about every three and a half feet. Now, it took about three years for this cystus to grow on this bank. It's a really tough plant that loves hot, dry situations. And look, you don't see any uh, of those horrible weeds growing here anymore. We don't even water this, and we get flowers to boot. Oh, la, la. You know, Western Washington is the fungus capital of the world, and nothing has more problems with fungus than these flowering cherries. Now, this is one of these weeping flowering cherries. It gets a nasty disease called brown rot, and what you're going to see is lots of dead twigs. Some years, the whole tree looks like it's dead. You almost see no new growth at all. Some years, it doesn't get it very bad at all. The way this disease works is that if you have the right temperature and it rains when the tree is in flower, then the fungus actually germinates in the flower, goes in, and that's how it kills the twigs. Now, there are some cherries that are resistant to this disease. The Yoshino and the Akibano cherry trees never get brown rot, so they might be a good choice for your campus. They get other problems, but they don't get brown rot. Now, what do we do to control this disease? Well. You know, if you don't do anything, IPM does not mean do nothing. If you do nothing and it gets brown rot year after year after year, there's a good chance that you might lose the tree or it'll get so filled with disease that it'll become totally ugly and you won't want it anymore anyway. So what we do is we monitor the tree. And some years the conditions are perfect for brown rot. The whole tree just looks like it's dead. Then the next year, we do the three sprays required. You have to do it when you see the first color in the bud, when the flowers are fully open, and when the flowers are just beginning to fade. So we'll do those three sprays the next spring on the cherry tree. And all we're trying to do is make sure that it doesn't get devastated by disease two years in a row. What we found that on these cherries at Seattle University, we have to spray about once every 10 years to control this disease. And you can see how good these cherry trees look right now. We've done a great job of controlling it and almost eliminated our spray program. One other thing you want to do is go up there in May and prune off all of the dead twigs. They oftentimes uh, are inoculators for the disease into the tree. So cut those off, get them out of there, and then just monitor and spray when necessary, and you'll keep your cherries looking great. Seattle University is a 59-acre campus. It's listed in most of the books that describe the best gardens in the United States. And Seattle University is the only college in the state of Washington designated by the State Department of Wildlife as a wildlife sanctuary. So you can use IPM and have an absolutely beautiful garden. Good luck.